Uh, we are officially started. Anybody that would be watching us in Facebook, um, we're officially started. We're going to be doing a new study today about talking of your, or controlling your tongue. Now, who here thinks they control their tongue? Depends on what you mean by that. I, I mean, control your tongue. I mean, um, I, as in, yes, I can control my tongue, but I don't control my tongue. Right. So the question was, who here thinks they control their tongue? Not can control. Oh, I thought the word can. Hey, it says can. But I'm, what I'm saying, and my question was, is who of us does? Will you, or can you? Can because I? we yeah. can, because yes. the Bible tells us to. Yeah. But most of us don't. don't. Yes. Okay, so those of us, we're going to start uh, with that. We're going to start um, in the book of James. And the book of James, uh, if you have your Bible... Open it up. If not, I have it on the screen. Uh, the judges. So, Marco, why don't you look up on, on the screen? Because by the time you find it... I'll find it. Okay. Uh, I promise. <laughs> Here. Do you, you want to read this out loud? Yeah, I'll read it. Okay. My brethren, let, me, let not many of you become teachers, knowing that... We shall receive a stricter judgment. For we all for we all stumble in many things. If anyone does not stumble in word, he is a perfect man, and also able to bridle the whole body. Indeed, we put bits in horses' mouths that they may obey us, and we turn their whole body. Look also at ships, although they are so large and are driven by fierce winds. They are turned by a go further, honey. James. Very small. What is that? Rudder. Yes. Wherever the pilot desires. Even so, the tongue is like a member and boasts great things. See how great a forest a little fire kindles. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. The tongue is just so set among our members that it defiles the whole body and sets us on fire the course of nature, and it is set on fire by hell. For every kind of beast and bird, a reptile and creature of the sea, is tamed, and has been tamed by mankind, but no man can tame the tongue. It is an unruly evil, full of deadly poison. With it we bless our God and Father, and with it we curse men, who have been made in the smallitude of God. Out of the same mouth, see blessing and cursing. My brother, these things ought not to be so. Does a spring send forth fresh water and bitter from the same opening? Can a fig tree, my brethren, bear olives or grapefruit? Bear, love, bear figs? Thus, no spring yields both salt water and fresh water. Very good. So that word, uh, it wasn't smiley to, it was similar to. Oh, similar to. Okay, similar. Sim similar. Sim right, they're similar to, we are created similar to God. Okay, uh, so this scripture basically is telling us that the tongue is our rudder, right? Uh -huh. As a little rudder steers and guides a big ship, a little tongue guides your whole body, right? Uh, and then it also is telling us, should fresh water and salt water come out of the same opening? No. It, it actually says it can't. Oh, it can't, okay. Now, this is obviously at the time of doing it. So, if you were drinking from a drinking fountain, yeah. and years ago there was a big scare of lead, lead poisoning, and some of the old drinking fountains that were in the schools and stuff like that uh, would give you contaminated water. So when you were drinking it, you were drinking contaminated water, water with lead. So this is an example of if you live on the coast. 
if you have a well, okay, you live in a marsh, you live by the salt sea, and your well water gets kind of contaminated with salt water. Can you drink fresh water? If, you, if it's coming up, well, can you drink fresh water? Oh yeah, there'll be fresh water in there. No, there are, but is it fresh water? No, because no, it's no, contaminated. It's contaminated because now, salt what if it's just contaminated a little bit? Is it still fresh water? No, because it still has the salt in it. Still has the salt in it. So, like, what if you have, uh, you can taste that salt yes, water, salt. but what if you're like drinking lead poison water, you know, from a drinking fountain? Just a little bit, and you can't even taste it. Well, it's still in there. It's still in there. It's still contaminated. Can you drink fresh water, not pure water, and contaminated water from the same opening at the same time? Technically, yes. No. Huh. They're both there. They're just mixed together. No, but then it's no longer fresh. It's, no, it's no longer, longer pure. Fresh. It's not, it's so you can't drink pure water and contaminated water from the same opening at the same time. It's just not a possibility. It's contaminated. It used to be pure, but now it has contaminant. It's contaminated. So... But it's both because it's been contaminated. It was fresh, but once the poison... Or if you take your cup... Yes. Okay? You can use the same... Get that bottle of water. A pure, use... fresh bottle. And I walk and spit in your cup. Wow. Can you drink that cup of water without having some spit in it? Probably not. No, you can't. So it's no longer pure. It's pure water plus. That's what I'm saying. That's so it's I'm not saying. pure. It's pure water plus. So pure, you lose your purity as soon as there's a contaminant in it. Right. So the point is, it's impossible for you to do that. But this is being written to Christians. Is it possible for a Christian to speak negative, bitter words out of his mouth and good words out of his mouth? Yes, yes. yeah, based on what I just read. Yeah, it's possible. Otherwise, he wouldn't be telling you not to do it. Yeah. So when we give these analogies, there's just analogy that, that James is using so that we know how ridiculous it seemed for a Christian to be cursing somebody who is made in the similitude of God. Okay? It doesn't mean it's not possible for a Christian, if you're a real Christian, to, to, to curse. Now, when it says curse, it's not using a cuss word. Usually when we say somebody's cursing, right, we're saying they're using a really colorful adjective, right? Like using the Lord's name in vain. It's another word Some, for curse. But curse basically is what? A curse. Speaking words of negativity to a person's life. Oh, wow. That's basically, you're going to get sick. Don't drink that water, you're going to get sick. I just cursed you. You take that thought captive and say, Although this water is contaminated, the word of the Lord clears it. Just as Elisha, with the school of prophets, there was bitter water, and Elisha cleansed that water. Okay? The pot. So we as Christians could take that dirty water. Let's say you're out in some third world country, and you're going to all die of thirst. You've got to drink the water. But do you want to get dysentery? No. Nope. They say, don't drink the water, you'll get Montezuma's revenge. You know what? I drink the water, I'm blessed. I don't get Montezuma's revenge because I've turned, I've negated that curse. What is that? Montezuma's revenge is basically a parasite you get into it that causes you to have diarrhea. It, a lot of people get it when they go to Mexico. It's a, it's a okay. phrase. Uh, what it is is uh, I thought everybody would recognize because that. the water is contaminated. Uh, generally, you end up with diarrhea and vomiting. Okay. Because your body can't handle the the bacteria and 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 stuff that is in the water. So when somebody says don't drink it, we would think that 
hey, that's a good warning. But yeah. that's actually a curse. Now, here's an example. Andrew Womack gave an example of that he was in this uh, third world, he was in this place, and they had some flooding, and the water all became contaminated, and uh, there was storm, and they locked them up in their motel room for, I don't know, three days or something like that. They couldn't come out. Uh, there was some unre unrest. Uh, no, it was a political unrest. They, they were in Uganda. That's where it was, I believe. And anyway, they couldn't leave his uh, motel room for three days. So he drank the water. Where did he drink the water? Right out of a water faucet. And they come back, and after the three days, he didn't get sick or nothing. They told him, well, you can't drink that water out of the water. It's contaminated. That's not pure water. You have to boil it first. You probably. either, well, you have to drink the bottled water that they have in this, that you, in, in the motel rooms that you pay a huge amount for. Well, he said, no, I, you know. I just drank it. There's nothing. We didn't have the okay to, to drink this bottle of water. Or it's the water fine enough. For, he never got sick. But after he knew that it was bad, he didn't drink it because he didn't want to tempt God. But the curse is there and it was negated because of, you can't curse God's people. But if you listen, if God's people say the same curse, that kind of negates or overrides God's blessing. See, Beta went to curse God's people, and God says that if you curse God's people, he'll turn it around to a blessing. You can't do it. Okay? But if the Christian accepts that lie... If they accept that curse, then it gives the demons, the evil spirits, the legal right to do that. Okay, I regress. Let's get on to our study notes. Okay, who would read nice and clear and loud um, the study notes? I have either you can have them on your paper or look up at the screen or on your own computer, wherever you have it. Who wants to read that? Starting from we know. Yes. We know that a teacher of God's word is judged much stricter than others. How many times have we heard that a pastor or an evangelist has fallen to sin? When this happens, they are often cast to the wolves to be devoured. Others try to separate themselves as far as possible in hopes of not having their sin exposed. It also seems if a man of God condemns the sinful actions of another, Satan will try to get him to stumble and transgress in the same area. The correlation between what comes out of our mouth and where we stumble is amazingly similar. This may be one reason people say, do not, do not judge. Nevertheless, we are to judge our brother that is in error. If not, he may stumble and fall, fall prey to the flesh. For we stumble in many things. If anyone does not stumble in word, he is a perfect man, able also to bridle the whole body. Amen. Very good. James 2, 3, 2. Okay, so when we, we've all heard of, and I, I use this analogy of teachers, uh, the Bible says that don't everyone strive to be a teacher because teachers are held at a stricter standard, a higher judgment. So I'm teaching this word of God. I'm held more accountable than you are receiving it. Now, who's going to, if I teach it wrong, who's going to punish me? God. No. Demon. God, I'm perfect. I'm holy. I'm righteous. I'm teaching the word of God incorrectly. I'm perfect. I'm holy. I'm righteous. Are these contradicting statements? Yeah, so who's the one that's going to accuse you? The devil. the devil. So when I preach the word incorrectly, I want to know how come I'm stumbling. How come I'm now having an affair? I was preaching against homosexuality. I was on the pulpit. I was teaching to the, what, the National Evangelical Moral Majority or Affiliation. Ted Haggard was the head of the national something, okay? 
and he start teaching against homosexuality. Now, he didn't get on the bandwagon and say this, but this was when they were first basically coming up with the gay pride uh, parades and stuff. Well, guess what happened to him? They beat him up. He fell spiritually and had an affair with a male homosexual prostitute. Wow. Where's the... So it's, there's an amazing correlation. Now, I know I've heard a lot of people, and some people have even contacted me and say, well, Ted Hager never did that. Mm -hmm. And I emailed him right on the audio clip where they did say that. Okay? The point is, is when you start to have a consciousness about sin and you're always talking about something, Dev brought it out. If you're always talking about it, that's probably what's affecting your life. What I say, if you're always talking about it, you're giving Satan an illegal right to cause that affect your life. So I'm not saying that Ted Haggard or other people, while they were preaching this, were engaged in this activity. I, but I am saying they did engage in it. And the Word of God says our tongue controls us where we're going to go. Well, when you... When you turn a rudder on a big ship, let's take a huge ship, like a, a freighter, right? A, those ones that bring all the cargo and stuff over from Japan, China. You know, it takes a long time to steer that ship. And that rudder's turned for a long, long time before the ship actually moves. Well, if you have a little uh, eight-foot boat or something, you turn the rudder, it turns pretty quick. quick. Okay? So sometimes we speak words and it takes a long time for us to get the concrete thing. So, is homosexuality wrong? Yes. yes, it is. Okay. Should we teach people? Yes, we do. But we teach them in humility. It says you use the scripture to correct in humility. Okay? and pray that God would grant them repentance, that they would come to their senses and escape the snare of the devil, having been taken captive by the devil to do his will. But people will say, well, all, all homosexuals are going to go to hell. God hates fags. All these kind of really bad things. That's not true. Well, all homosexuals, as all murderers, as all liars, will be cast into the lake of fire. But guess what? Which is the second death. Yes, yes, but guess yes. what? When you come to Christ, Christ yes. makes you a new creation. Yes, yes. So you could have been a homosexual yesterday, except the Lord Jesus Christ become a new creation, yes, yes, yes. and you are no longer a homosexual today. Right. So no homosexuals will go to heaven, but that doesn't mean that somebody that was engaged in homosexuality yes. Yes. can't go to heaven. Just means you can't be that way and think you're going to go. You're serving a false god. Okay. Uh, so we got to we got to be able to preach this. But the point is, uh, we got to be able to preach it with humility. The point is um, that if you're able to control your tongue, you're a perfect man. So what does it mean to be perfect? Like God. Like God, yeah. Well, is that the perfect cup of coffee? Yeah. Yeah? So if you added any more sugar, would it be perfect? It'd be too sweet, right? It wouldn't taste as good. It would taste like, it would taste like um, um, syrup. Okay, so right now it's perfect. If you put anything into it, more additional to it, it would no longer be perfect. perfect yeah. So if you're able to control your, your tongue, you're a perfect man. Why? Because your tongue guides your whole body. Now God made you perfect. Did he make your body perfect? Yeah. You know what? I'm, I I'm say, walked I by say. the bathroom when you've gone to the bathroom and it stinks. <laughs> Your body's not perfect. Your body's going to corrupt. Your body's going to decay. <laughs> not as bad as mine. I know my body's not perfect. My brain's not perfect. My soul's not perfect. 
but my spirit is, because it's a new creation, okay? So, the word perfect, we find in the Strong's Concordance, they label it under number uh, 5046, the Greek word, and what it means is to be completeness. But in this reference, full of age, perfect. So, we can use it as an analogy of mature Christian. How about if you're a doctor? Let's say you go to become a, uh, just a, a, a back surgeon, right? Mm -hmm. When are you perfect as a back surgeon? When you've been doing it a long time. How about when you graduate high school, uh, 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 college? Then you're still learning. How about when you uh, graduate being an intern and you get hired on? Then you still would be learning, but then you... Are you perfect? Yeah. Having all knowledge doesn't make you perfect because theoretically, when he graduated, he had all the knowledge he would ever need. And then, theoretically, when he went to that internship, he was able to apply that knowledge under the tutorage of somebody else. And then, theoretically, he was able to go on on his own. But, there was, who do you want to be with? The guy who's doing back surgery one, or the guy that's done a hundred back surgeries? A hundred. Because you want maturity, right? We want, so we want maturity. Who's a mature Christian? Somebody that has been bridling their tongue for a long time. Be perfect. So can you have all knowledge and be perfect? Can you read the, the Holy Spirit teaches us all day? No, it's a it's a learning process. You make mistakes. Okay, you got to be able to apply what the Word of God says to your present day situation and to the uh, the people that you're ministering to, right? And that makes you perfect. And then you bridle your tongue. You know, you can't drink. Pastor will say, you can't drink. Alcohol is bad. Can't drink. They're not bright only in their tongue. They're not mature. They could be a Christian for decades. They could be pastors for decades. They're not mature because the Bible doesn't say you can't drink. The Bible actually tells you you can and you should drink. But the Bible says is don't drink in excess. Don't get drunk. Okay? So... These Christians that say, the Bible says don't drink, say, well, in Jesus' time, it was just grape juice. It wasn't really alcohol. No, it was alcohol. It's not true. They got drunk, it says. You know, when we're taking communion, Paul comes and addresses them, or Luke, who wrote this under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, addresses the people um, in, in, in Acts, and then in Corinthians, where Paul was addressing the Corinthians, they came together to eat and take communion and got drunk. Oh, wow. Okay? They got drunk. So that wine wasn't grape juice. Yeah, it wasn't grape juice. Okay? It was fermented grape juice, right? So they're not mature. So maturity comes from having complete knowledge applying that knowledge correctly and then having victory, right? Are you mature if you do a back surgery and you screw up? You could no. be. No, you're, you're not. If you screwed up, you're still a novice in that area. You're not perfect. You made a mistake. I'm not saying something went wrong with the person you're having the back surgery, but if the doctor left a sponge or a, 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 a hypodermic, or a, 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 a thing that clamps off the ve vessels, in your body, which happens, are they perfect? No, they can even be sued because it was an error on the doctor, not a complication, right? So, 
To be perfect, you have to be mature, you have to have full knowledge, and you have to have victory. You have to but do even, it right. Even surgeons that have been surgeons for many years and performed the same surgery over and over and over again, they can have still that. make a mistake. That means they're not perfect yet. And they may never be. They may never be, but it's possible to be. In Christ, it's possible to be. But then you run the risk of them thinking they're a God because they're That's true. right. That's right. And that happens with Christians. You run the work when you're perfect, when you apply the word good. You run the, you run the risk of you being godlike. And the Bible does say, as Christ is, so are you. Well, then you go like, well, I'm like God. And, 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 and you have the desire to be like God. Isn't that how Satan fell? I want to be like God. Okay? I am like God, but it's not because I want to be like God. I am like God because what God did to me. Okay? So, perfection, I want to put out there, is when we guide our tongue, bridle our tongue, it makes us perfect. But it is an ongoing process. Okay? I say and do things different now than I did 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 40 years ago. Okay? So how about bridle? So if you're a, per a man that bridles his tongue is perfect, right? So I kind of went backwards. I told you what perfection is first. But what's bridle? What's it mean to bridle your tongue? To hold it in check. Just to restrain. Control it. To control it. So what if you just don't say something? Somebody says something evil. Somebody says we should have Sharia law. And you don't say anything. Is that right only in your tongue? Uh, no. You should stand up. Oh, so bridle in your tongue isn't just not saying something. No. It's right. saying the correct right. something. Just restrain it. To say not evil, but say good, but you got to say something. So just being quiet is not bridle in your tongue. We've heard we have the analogy bite your tongue. You know, somebody says something to you and you want to hurt. That's not bridle in your tongue. Well, sometimes it is. That's not bridle in your tongue. Sometimes it is. When That's you just your tongue, not saying something. Because if you say something, it could hurt the other person. If you say the right thing, it raises people up and it brings life and peace and blessing. If you say the wrong thing, it curses them. The point is, is the only thing in your mind to say is the wrong thing. And you know and that, so you don't want to say that. So that is bridling. But it's not bridling. Bridling is controlling and leading. Okay, so when you put a bridle, I see your hand up, Mark. I'll get it. Just don't lose that thought. When you put a bridle on a horse, it's not a bit. The bridle. So like Indians even had it, like you just put a loop around the lower jaw. And you could tie your rope on both sides and go around the neck. What's the bridle do? It pulls the head. It moves the head. It stops the head from going the wrong direction. Because a horse goes wherever the head is. So if a horse is going that way and you pull on this bridle where its head gets twisted all the way to the left, the horse cannot run straight ahead. If the horse is going to continue to run, it has to go to the left. Okay? So a bridle steers, is the rudder. The bit restrains. The bit, you put that bit in your mouth and it pushes down onto the back of their, their uh, tongue and it causes them discomfort and they stop doing what they're doing. So you pull and put the bit to quit doing a bad thing. The bridle doesn't need a bit, and that's just to control it where it's going. But you are going there. So the bridle in your tongue is you are speaking. You have to speak. So how come it says up there, bridle, in the Greek, 54, 68, to lead by or bridle to guide, 
to bridle, to hold in check, check. Uh -huh. restraint, train. Well, uh, and then the so that means I'm not going to say that. I'm going to hold back. No, sometimes it's better. what I'm saying is I want to go. I want to. I'm glad you, that proves you're paying attention. What this is is bridal is this fifty four sixty eight, but bridal is from what? It's from fifty four sixty five, which is the curved ahead. Stall, curbing of the spirit, a bit or a bridle. So it comes from this point of restraining. It comes from this point of not saying a word. Sometimes it's better not to say Sometimes it is. That's what I'm trying to I say. I know, but what I'm saying, it's not a bridle. It comes, that's what this word, it comes from a bit. So sometimes when you have nothing good to say, don't say anything at all. But don't think that don't saying anything at all is going to make a horse go to the right direction. What it's going to do is, if the horse is going the wrong direction, and you're yanking on that and he's doing something wrong, it's going to stop them from doing something wrong. Do you see the difference? So, as my wife was so clearly stating, sometimes we bite our tongue, but that's not bridling it. That is putting a bit, that's restraining it. Okay? It's not leading anything. Yes, sir. Okay, I was on a reference on what Des, what Des was saying. Let's say my supervisor says something in front of the whole group, and I know what they will say was wrong. Mm -hmm. It would be wise of me not to, you know, say, correct that individual in front of everybody. Maybe after everybody's gone, I could say, well, we should use cold water instead of hot water. Yes. So, under today's analogy, you would be bridling your tongue, right? Right. So, you are correct. It would be good not to voice anything in front of everybody. And, because and, that's his boss, and he would be right. countermanding what his boss is saying. But under the, under the scripture, we got to understand the, def the definitive of these two words. Okay. Uh, if, if you don't turn the rudder, is the ship going to turn? No, no, no. No. So you, the bridle, you have to speak. Okay. But it comes from this thing of stopping. So there is that analogy. If you don't have something good to say, don't say anything. At all. Don't say anything at all. Yeah. Okay. Where Des said correctly, it's better sometimes not to say anything. Yeah. I just want to put it out. That does not change your course. Okay. Where it changes your course is the power of the tongue mm -hmm. to either cause blessing or cursing. Yes, sir. Okay, so you said bridling, bridling my tongue, right? Yes. That means, like, you know, saying something with, you know, out, saying something, but like, by like correcting. Okay, so. Uh, so, there's been a couple incidences with my brother, because uh, 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 he, he would always, you know, wake up in the morning angry and stuff, mm -hmm. and so, <clears throat> and so like, he would say something, like, he would, like, say something that, that he would think he would be right on and then I would say something to fully under, to fully explain myself and then after I'm done explaining myself he would turn around and cry and then tell me why would you say that to me and then when he was real. So yes, that is broader. Whether it was good or bad, we're not saying whether it was salt water or fresh. Okay. Okay, but it is bridling. Okay, so I want to come back to this point: Can you bridle and restrain? Yes, you can, but it's still a, a difference. When you put a bridle around a horse's mouth, no bit, and a horse is rearing up, wanting to uh, buck, go up. What do you do? You restrain it. You, cur you, you restrain it, you put it in check. How do you do that? You change the direction. 
If you pull on them reins, you don't have a bit, it's not going to make the horse gay, but what's it do? It pulls its head down. A horse cannot rear up if its head's down. Okay? If, a head, if the horse wants to go down on the ground, lay down and go down, if you pull the head up, it can't go to the ground. So, that's where this word restraining is. You're restraining, you're keeping that head from going the direction it wants to go. But when you bridle and you just like put the, put the, the reins on it to turn left and just go like that, it will go. It will steer that way. Okay? So that's why these words are from. But the point I'm trying to make, and the Bible is trying to make, is if you don't say nothing, nothing's going to happen. But don't say any curse. Because when a Christian curses, it gives legal right for a demon to go do that. How many Christians talk to their mount, their mates or, or their friends, so, their spouses or their children and just say you're terrible. Yeah. You're doing this. You're no good. If you'd only do it my way. That's a curse. You could get the same result of them stopping, them doing something else by using a blessing, right? By saying something different. But that only comes from maturity. And usually the maturity we only get from doing it wrong so many times. We don't learn not to do it right. But if we were following the Holy Spirit, we'd never have to do it wrong. We don't have to do it wrong. I do not have to beat my wife to know that it's wrong to beat my wife. Yeah. Okay? And like with the kids growing up, when they would do something wrong, I would say, um, you're doing wrong. And I don't like what you're doing because it's wrong, but that doesn't mean that I don't love you. Okay. My mom would just send you to the corner. Okay. Here's a, a different example. I was really hurt by some church members, by multiple pastors that really conspired again, and they really hurt me. And I was being self righteous. And I was right, and I was proclaiming I was right, and I was proclaiming they were wrong, and I was proclaiming they had to repent. And nothing happened. But that was right here. We still got it on video where I sat there and repented and forgave these pa the pastors. And guess what? One of these pastors has come back, and, and, and it's not perfect, but it's good. He's come back, and he's fellowshipping with them, and his heart is good and pure and loving and it's starting to working. Why? Because I'm controlling the situation of blessing and not cursing. As long as I'm cursing, I'm giving my adversary, the devil, the right to work in their life. Now when's the devil ever going to bring unity? When is he ever going to bring reconciliation? Never. He only brings death, right? And arguments and discord. Okay? But when you speak forgiveness, and I spoke blessing, guess what? It stopped them demons from doing it. It didn't change that man's heart. God, I, I, if God was able to change the way you think, you would just say, okay, everybody believe on Jesus. Right? But no. But what you do is you got to quit them demons from hearing. So when the demons are saying, hey, I have the right. John is right. He's 100% right. Here's the accusation to you. You are wrong. But when I spoke forgiveness publicly, the demon couldn't say that anymore. So what did Brian hear? Only what the Holy Spirit has to say because you don't have that chatter. You don't have all that background noise. You don't have all these Holy Spirit speaking to you in the clear small voice and all this yelling and screaming that demons do. You, you understand what I'm saying? Okay, point one. A Christian, now there's uh, ten points I think right here. So I don't know if we're going to get done. I don't think so. Uh, we may go on at about a uh, half hour right now. But point one says, A Christian's mind can become more like God 
by seeking the face of Jesus every day, the closer your soul gets to God, the easier it is to bridle your tongue. So, my spirit's not going to do anything wrong. But my mind can think wrong thoughts, and my soul can take these situations and look at it through its emotions. So, defining the mind is we all have a mind, right? And our mind is made up of certain facts. You live in America, you live in California, you were raised in the 80s, the 70s, the 60s, the 90s. You're going to be raised with certain facts. But your emotion lets you interpret those facts differently. Let's say you're, uh, you're raised in Sacramento, okay? And you're raised in a town where uh, there's a lot of prejudice. Now, the police could come, people could get elected, policies could be made, and you will interpret that information differently than somebody who's not raised in a prejudiced town, right? Same fact, same mind, but different soul. So our soul is our mind, will, and emotion. Our mind is just the thing that sits on the on our brain head, able to store facts and bring those facts back up, recall uh, recall information. You understand where what I'm going to, when I say that? So the closer you get to seek God's face, my spirit's already perfect, right? My spirit's not going to become more godlike when I'm spending a trillion years with God in heaven, right? Than it is already. It's already holy and perfect complete. But my mind here on earth, while I'm here on earth, the closer I seek God's face, the more my mind comes into the real understanding because my, and my emotions get curbed, or bridled, curbed, to believing the way God believes. Right? Hey, my brother's a homosexual. I'm not taking you out, but I love him. How could God hate him? How could God put him in there? Well, the Bible never says God hates him because he's a homosexual. The Bible never says God hates people because they're homosexual. The Bible says they have exchanged the truth of God for a lie, and God has given them over to a debased mind, and that's why they became. Yes, sir. Now, you break up a good point. Hopefully, a lot of good points. <laughs> no, no, okay. Well, what I was going to say is because, you know, like you said, uh, you know, you go to, I went to this one church. Uh, they call themselves, well, I'm, I'm not, I'm not getting Yeah, don't that. say the name. Yeah. Right. But what I was going to say is that, you know, that's what he said. Uh, you know, basically what he said, God hates homosexuals. Yeah. But he didn't talk about the, the, the fact that, you know, you can repent. Right. Okay. Right. Yeah, homosexuality is a byproduct of an action of exchanging the truth of God for a lie. Just like stealing and doing drugs. Right? Just like stealing and doing drugs. But is it harder to escape homosexuality than stealing and doing drugs? Absolutely. The Bible says the sins of the flesh are the hardest to deal with. Okay? It's a lot harder. I tell you, as a elderly man, it's a lot easier for me to say, hey, restrain for lust than it is for a 25-year-old. Oh, yeah. Okay? They, I, I'm virile, or vir virile, whatever, but not like I was when I was younger. Yeah. Okay? There's a lot of difference. Okay. We have to have that compassion. We have to have that understanding when we talk to people. Okay? i got to say one more thing. And yes. I'll, and I'll be quiet after this. It's kind of like... No, the point, this isn't a sermon, this okay, is okay. a teaching. I'm teaching right. you the Word of God to control. So that's why we have this dialogue. It's kind of like, well, thank God I'm not in this situation. But let's suppose I, somebody lived in my apartment and they were verbally abusing you know, and physically abusing another person. Yes. To just be quiet and not do anything, it's not the right thing. I mean, no, it's not. 
I could, uh, even if I didn't want to get directly involved, I could at least call the police and say, you know, there's a disturbance upstairs. So that is true. That I think that you know you, you need to that you, you should come and deal with. So yeah, so doing nothing is not not good. It's not putting a curse or a blessing on your life. We have to do something. Okay. So this is why we have to stand up against false teaching. Okay? We have to stand up against ISIS. We have to stand up against that book you just bought, the book of Enoch. It is not a book of God. It is not inspired by God. I have to stand up. Otherwise, I'm letting it speak curses. But if I don't rebuke those curses, it's not going to happen. The other night, uh, somebody, we were having the teaching, they said, well, you can get an earache, because, you know, the spam blowing in my ear. I got, no, I'm not. I rebuke that. I'm not going to accept that. Okay? But you have to rebuke it. And if you don't, if you're quiet, who's the one yelling and screaming? The, the other person, right? Okay, okay, okay. So he's putting blessing and cursings out, right? And I don't think he's doing any blessing, right? No, no, no. Okay. Point two. Any any comments, Bob? No. Okay, point two. A mature Christian is more likely to control his tongue knowing it guides his whole body. Nor will he bring condemnation upon himself as others by the misuse of his tongue. He is a free man, not under any bond, any bondage. So when you know that you're complete in Christ, you're not going to walk around saying, Oh, I'm just a sinner saved by grace. Oh, i got to go repent every day. i got to ask God to forgive me for this evil thought I had. When you're a mature Christian, you know that you're completely sinless, you're free. The Bible says you cannot sin if you're a Christian. So you're getting these evil thoughts. The Bible tells you how to attack that. Take that thought captive and turn it around to the obedience of Christ. So, does it ever tell you to repent or ask God to forgive you for having a bad thought? No. No. So you could be, as a guy, having, uh, who get turned on by female, really nice looking bodies, right? Mm -hmm. And you could be in Davis in the springtime when all the girls are trying to show off, right? And um, riding their bikes with yes. short tops and short shorts. shorts. Okay. And you could, you're going to see them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you can look at them and you can say, wow, wow, that, you know, sex, get turned on, right? right? How do you take that, you can't stop that thought. How do you take that thought captive and turn it around to the obedience of Christ? And it turns that lust. So what I tell people is, you start looking at that as your daughter. Oh, wow. Guess what? There's no sexual attraction. Whatever you had before, it's gone. Instantaneous. Then you, how do you turn that around for the obedience of Christ? You pray for that man, that, 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 that daughter's husband, her, uh, father. You pray for that man that he, that doesn't allow Satan to come in because he knows other people are looking at his daughter. That he might call his daughter a tramp, you know. He might say, "Well, you're just dressing up like, like you're selling something. What are you selling?" You know, dads say that, right? So you start praying for that dad not to curse his daughter. You take that thought and you turn it around to the obedience of Christ, and you're not thinking about having sex with that girl. Because you just turned around to your daughter, and guess what? She's somebody's daughter. Right? I mean, their parents may be dead, but she's somebody's daughter. Somebody cares for that human being. Okay? So we can take our thoughts captive and turn around, but we can't keep those thoughts from coming. How do they come? The devil puts them out there. Now, is the devil going to try to do that when you've beaten them a hundred times at the same thing? 
No, he's going to try something different. different yeah. He's going to, this isn't working. Let me try something else. Well, he's not turned on the girls anymore. Let me use pride. Let me use money. Let me use something else. Okay? Uh, if you're out fishing and the bait you're using isn't working, change the bait. Right? Okay, so moving on. That, that's how we're free. Point two is when you're mature, you don't condemn yourself. You don't walk around saying you're a sinner. You're evil. you got a sin nature. What you go around is you speak words. I am, the Bible says I'm not a sinner. Therefore, there is no condemnation to me. The Bible says I cannot sin. Therefore, God can never be angry with me. The Bible says those that walk in the Spirit are no longer under the law. So I could never be condemned. So you had this thought. You could turn it around. You could turn it around. Okay? My, my uh, ex-pastor, when he talked about this, said, uh, when you have a thought, you're bad. What? Yeah. That's not true. At Calvary Tabby, when you have a bad thought. So if you have a lustful thought, you're bad. And I believed him. And so I went and I confessed to my wife that I committed adultery. I never committed adultery. I had a bad thought. And that bad thought I kept taking it. It led on to where I had a decision where I could have. Okay? And I did kiss her. And I've kissed a lot of, a lot of females at church kiss up. But this wasn't a kiss for that. This was a kiss that I felt. I felt some stirring. Okay? So I had to take that thought captive and I had to say, no, I'm not going to do this. And so when she came and made uh, opportunity, I had to say no. Wow. And I confessed that to my wife. And it caused a lot of problem. Under the correct teaching was Hey, John, you did right. I had this thought. I took it captive. You were a little slower. <laughs> you were a little slower than you should have been. Okay? So we got to have right teaching. Uh, yes, sir. Because I know it talks about uh, being in the world but not of the world. Yes. But at the same time, avoidance is not necessarily the answer. Because if I say, well, if I don't go outside, then I won't be tempted. Right. But then that's a lot. Well, the Bible, the Bible says, I never told you to keep up, not keep company with the sexually immoral and the murderers and thieves that are in the world. Uh -huh. But if somebody claims to be a Christian, mm -hmm. you're not even to eat with them. That's one of the huge scriptures why celebrate recovery is absolutely against the scripture. Because if you claim to be a Christian and you say you have a sex problem, I'm not to eat with you. If you claim to be a Christian and say you have a drug problem, I'm not even to eat with you. If you claim to be a Christian and say that you're an alcoholic, I'm not even to eat with you, according to Scripture. But I can hang out with people that are not Christians and say I'm a gay, lesbian, uh, bisexual, I do drugs, and I steal and lie any chance I get. Yeah. You're the, you can hang out with them because how are they going to see the light? Okay, so in other words, the, the first person you're talking about is a liar. Then. He's, a, well, he's a liar. And the Bible says also, evil company corrupts good habits. So you can't get together with a whole bunch of people that claim to be Christians and saying they're having these problems. What you get to do is you take them individuals alone and you put them with a mentor, someone who can teach you, no, you're not a drug addict. You're holy and righteous in God's eyes. God says, as you, as Christ is, so are you in this world. Is Christ addicted to heroin? No. 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 And you know what? You get free because you change your mind. And I know, uh, when I go to jail, I know a lot of heroin addicts that quit just like that. You know how I know they quit just like that? They don't get drugs. 
And some of them, when they come back, go right back into it. But others don't. <clears throat> others just, just like that, they quit. And they don't go back into it. Okay? So, if you're a new creation, can you be an alcoholic? No. No. If the old is dead, if the old died, can you be an alcoholic? No. No. So if you say you're an alcoholic, what you're saying is, my old nature is still alive and well. And they'll say, yep, that's exactly right. So they'll use a different text, like the NIV, that says you have a dual nature. But the Alexandrian, uh, the Texas Receptus, in the Greek, makes it clear that you cannot have a dual nature. You can only have one. Christ is not going to be married and could be committing adultery. If your old man's still alive, you cannot be a Christian. If you have a dual nature, you are not born again. So then, let me ask you this. So then, when, why did Jesus bring up if a man, uh, what is it? He, in other words, okay, wait. We can, now, if I think in, in, in my mind by having a, what, adultery with someone, yeah. I, I, I've already done it. But, well, he did. But what is he talking about when about adultery? Yeah, basically you're having a, an affair with a woman who's married, right? Okay. Okay. Or that word adultery is even pornea, so that you could be with your own wife oh, huh. doing something. Let's say anal sex. Huh. That's, that, if you look it up in the Greek, that's pornea, and that could be a, translated as adultery. Okay? So the point is, not that, but it's if you look in your mind, and I want to steal from this other man, his wife. Let's say he's got the hottest, most beautiful wife. And you go, wow, I wish I had his wife. Now I'm, I'm stealing. Now I'm coveting. And I haven't actually performed the act. Right. But why don't I? Because he's a bigger man than I did. And he'll kick my butt. Right, 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 right. He will probably kill me. Yeah. That guy got more guns than the National Guard. I ain't getting close to him. So, why didn't I commit adultery? Because I was a coward. Okay. And no coward shall enter the kingdom of God. Okay. okay, so you did it in your heart, but the only thing that kept you from actually physically doing it wasn't because you took that thought captive. It wasn't because you controlled it, but because you're a coward. It's a little different than looking at, wow, so, she's hot. So, yes. cowards don't make it into every corner. Like, the Word of God says, all cowards shall be cast into the lake of fire. Okay. If you're a coward, you will go to hell. So, can a Christian be a coward? Yes. No? No. If all cowards go to hell, can a Christian be a coward? No. No. you got to start believing the Word of God. The Word of God says, I'm not a coward. I'll stand up and you can threaten to kill me and I'll preach the gospel. If you would fillet me or cut my head off, I'll preach the gospel. Well, if you cut your head off, you ain't going to do nothing. Well, I'll that. preach it beforehand, you know. <laughs> but Paul, right, he was, I'm willing to go to Caesar. I know I'm going to die. He wasn't a coward. All these apostles were Martyr, right? They were killed preaching about. Were they cowards? No. A coward would say, no, I don't believe in Jesus. <clears throat> no, I'm not going to get persecuted. Let's just do it quietly. But the same people that were persecuting and they were hiding from the Jews for fear, hiding in the upper room for fear of the Jews. Those are cowards. Hey, those apostles, as soon as Jesus came, and they became born again. He blew into them and they received the, Holy the new spirit, the Holy Spirit. They no longer were cowards. But Jesus says, hey, come on, wait up. I know you got but wiggles now, but wait until you get power from high. Because now you got the heart to do it, but you don't have the ability. But, so wait until you get baptized. So they were, they were, they were cowards before? And they weren't born again. See, none of the apostles were born again until after Jesus' resurrection. Yeah, then he said, I'll send that over. That's right. See, so people really say, well, Jesus, uh, Peter denied Jesus. Yeah. You know, we can deny Jesus. 
No, Peter wasn't a Christian when he denied Jesus. Oh. But they, oh, because he saw his example. No, because Peter, 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 Peter got crucified upside down to prove a point. But that has nothing to that do with what works. Yeah. Go, go ahead. Go ahead. I said that has nothing to do with that, that statement, what we're talking about. But what I'm saying is when you're a Christian, you no longer are a coward. You're a mighty man of God. You are mighty. You are able to take down strongholds. But you've got to believe the Word of God. So when people sit there and say, oh, well, we just, these people, it's okay for them to denounce Jesus. It's what you believe in your heart. No, it's not. If you denounce Jesus, you're a coward, and no coward will go to heaven. Okay? How about a liar? It says all liars will be thrown in the lake of fire. Well, take it in context. John, the same guy who wrote the, uh, the book of Revelation under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, wrote the epistles of John. And he says, what is a liar but he that denies that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh? Hmm. So he already clarifies what a liar. So anyone that, that says that Jesus Christ did not come in the flesh is a liar and will go to hell. I'm not going to go to hell because I say my wife looks really beautiful and she got a wart, a pimple on the side of her, growing out of the side of her face. I'm just being smart. Okay. You know? <laughs> if I say, woman, go back to bed because you like, look bad. Yeah, yeah. You know what? I might go to heaven earlier. Yeah. <laughs> right? Okay, so... Uh, Let's see, um, let me finish one. I don't know how long we, when we started for sure. Uh, well, it, uh, That's the beginning. Um, yeah. beginning uh, uh, um, uh, it was like 12, like 30, when we, when we... No, no, it was, it was, it was like almost 12 o'clock when we started. Yeah. Okay. I, I actually could tell you how long it's, we've been talking. No, I can't. Um, an hour and two minutes and 30 seconds. Yes, yeah, yeah, about it and two, so we started right now. So this is, let's just keep it down to, a, to that hour thing. We'll pick this up next week. So we stop at point three. Yes. Okay. And uh, we will pick up, no, we stopped at point four. Des read James three. So people on Facebook, you can get these notes uh, right off of my page. You could go to I Believe God Ministries, the group, and you could get these study notes. But I already have posted them on my own home page. I hope you read them. I hope you like them. Uh, and I hope you're learning something about controlling your tongue. Because everything you say, there's going to be... It gives power for a result, for an action. So that's yes. Do we want to go to lunch? Yes, sir. I just said something, right? Yes. Sir. If I never said that, we may want to, but would we go? No. No. So there's power in the word. Amen? Amen. Bye. Bye, everybody. Let me close up. I wonder why I pushed record. I wonder why that didn't work. Okay. I'm done with the coffee. You're done, you're done with the coffee? That's good. That's good because that coffee has just got way too much.